In part one, we discussed how and why Sudan's popular revolutionary movement accepted a fragile power sharing relationship between a so-called transitional military council and a civilian government. Yet there's much more to this story that needs to be unpacked. On October 23, 2020, Sudan shocked the world by agreeing to normalise relations with Israel, a long-time nemesis, for over 50 years. Less than two years after Sudan's popular revolution. The question on many people's minds was how and why did we get to this point? Was the country's status as a state sponsor of terror leveraged by Washington to force the so-called peace deal. So you mentioned the delisting of Sudan from the state sponsor of terror. Many international observers say that that had less to do with the compensation offered to American victims of terror and more to do with Sudan agreeing to normalize relations with Israel. And how big a role do regional Arab regimes play in Sudan's future? What happens after the transitional period is over? Has the country's future foreign policy already been decided before a ballot has been cast? And what role does Sudan's participation in the Saudi-led war on Yemen play in all of this. With so many foreign powers competing for control, can Sudan's revolution still be salvaged? In terms of Arab states, Sudan is not as rich as the United Arab Emirates or Bahrain. It doesn't have a significant Palestinian population like Jordan and is not as powerful or as influential as Egypt, yet the normalization deal with Israel was important to the Israelis because of its symbolic significance. It was a 1967 Khatoum conference in Sudan where the free nodes were established. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. A fact that did not escape the former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> In October 2020, one month before the US elections, Trump announced that Sudan will start to normalize ties with Israel, making it the fifth Arab state to do so and the third Arab state as part of the US brokered deals in the run up to the US presidential elections known as the Abraham Accords. The announcement that Sudan will follow Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates came as a shock as until that point, the transitional government and Sudan's transitional prime minister, Abdullah Hamdok, said that normalization with Israel was a decision to be decided by a democratically elected Sudanese government and not an unelected transitional one. I asked the spokesman for Sudan's transitional government, Faisal Mohammed Salah, what had changed. It was a very difficult situation. And uh, the economic uh, expert, our economic expert, our economic minister said that Sudan cannot tolerate the sanction for seven or two months after election. If we said no, then we will wait for the election. Then the new administration will have six, seven, eight uh, months until they have done all the uh, the heavy duty that they they are supposed to do, the homework, until they can discuss things with Sudan. This is a very long time, Sudan cannot tolerate. So uh, the government had to do that, had to promise. After decades of sanctions and financial isolation, many in Sudan had hoped the revolution would bring better economic days ahead. Yet for Washington, it wasn't that simple. And they would demand more, a lot more, before they began loosening the noose. In 1973, US President Richard Nixon and his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger allegedly instructed the CIA to make Chile's economy scream 
in order to remove the democratically elected socialist president Salvador Allende from power. What I gathered from my long talk with Faisal Mohammed Salah was that the Nixon and Kissinger approach had been successfully redeployed almost 50 years later by Trump and Pompeo. How do you guys feel about normalization with Israel? How do you feel? Morally, it's, it's morally it's bad. wrong. <laughs> but for economy, it is okay. Yeah, morally, but morally like, I feel bad for it. the Palestinian people. Yeah. Yet to my surprise, there was not widespread anger against the normalization deal with Israel that I was expecting. <laughs> And when I spoke to the traders and those in the Sudanese markets, they were largely indifferent, with some saying they would support it if it helped the economy. These people work in the market from sunrise to sunset for very little money and because of high inflation, the US dollar had become like gold dust. And because of the unaffordable fuel costs, just getting to work had become a daily nightmare for many. Because the price of fuel is so high, the demand for public transportation is intense. For many commuters, a small journey home can take several hours. Transportation was so bad that many people had to resort to this. See this? The car doesn't know these people. He's just going straight down this road. So all these people have just jumped on. I think they're going to school, university. You must have picked up for free down the road at least 20 people. On top of that, everywhere I went, I saw huge queues. Queues for bread, for fuel, for transport, for everything. I just wanted to show you guys something. So people are wondering, oh, why is Sudan decided to normalize with Israel? Well, basically the answer stands right behind me. The country is starving, economically castrated. Look at this queue, just for fuel. Can you see that? You see that? And the queue goes for miles, goes all the way back as well. Can you see that? Shortly after Sudan agreed to normalize relations with Israel, the US fulfilled their promise and took Sudan of the state sponsor of terrorist. Yet economically speaking, it felt that very little had changed and the protest appeared to be a daily occurrence. So there's a protest here in Khartoum. Tires are burning, as you can see. Give it a shot. I'm not quite sure what they're protesting, but they've uh, blocked off the road. I'm gonna walk forward and have a look. I sat down with Sarah. She explained how the new decision makers had influenced the masses into thinking that normalization with Israel would bring a brighter economic future for all Sudanese citizens. I asked her if this contrasted with how the resistance committees felt about Sudan establishing relations with Israel. The normalization deal was, however, widely condemned by Sudan's political parties that were essential in putting the civilian transitional government into power. I had arranged to meet Sudan's last democratically elected prime minister, Sadiq al Mehdi, but he was sick and sadly passed away on the 26th of November 2020. Al Mehdi was one of the country's most popular politicians and one of the first to voice his rejection to the normalization deal.
الملاحق جنائيا في بلاده قررت أن تصير دولة عنصرية تحرم مليون فلسطيني من حقوق المواطنة فيها I did speak to Kamal Baloud from Sudan's Ba'ath Party. He was under the impression that this normalization deal was not necessarily set in stone. سيظل لوقت السودان مربوط بهذا المحور ولكن أعتقد إذا جاءت حكومة منتخبة انتخاب جماهيري وبتفويض أوسع سوف تعيد النظر في كل علاقات السودان الخارجية إذا كان اللي تم بناء في ظل نظام سابق أو في ظل المرحلة الانتقالية حتى يتوازن السودان ويقوم في وضعه الطبيعي والصحيح At the start it began as if it is Trump joke in this election campaign However, it seems uh, it is more than that. It is part of the new Middle East strategy. That's my father, Dr. Sidki Capello, a leading member of the Sudanese Communist Party in Sudan and a lecturer at Al Hafad University. As a long-time critic of Omar al-Bashir's government, he was forced into exile for 17 years and was allowed to return after the 2005 comprehensive peace agreement that was signed in Addis Ababa. However, after permanently relocating to Sudan in 2009, he was detained several times without charge, most recently as the protests to topple Omar al-Bashir began to intensify in Khartoum, and now he's firmly under the impression that foreign powers have allowed Sudan's revolution to be stolen. They are interested in the Sudan because they are interested in the security of the Red Sea. Both Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, the Americans, Egypt, they want, they don't want a regime which has relations with other countries like Russia, Iran, in the Red Sea. The third thing is that they are hungry for the lands and the waters of the Sudan, and they want to invest money. A democratic system might not be the best for such investment. It was obvious it wasn't just my father that was disappointed about how things had played out. I sat down with Yasser Arman, who's the deputy leader of Sudan People's Liberation Movement North, the Malik Aga faction. He was a key military figure in the SPLM's long civil war against Omar al Bashir's regime during the late 80s, the 90s, and early 2000s. He had an interesting story, as not only was he Bashir's cousin, but he was also intimately familiar with the nature of the military apparatus after fighting them in Sudan's longest and bloodiest conflict. Bashir has heavily politicized uh, the military uh, establishment and the military and security sector. Uh, Sudan needs uh, professional, non-politicized uh, military and security sector. And you can't build uh, a civilian state and a democratic state, a state of uh, equal citizenship without discrimination unless uh, you reform and modernize security uh, and military sector. What was worrying was that Sudan's strongest and best funded institutions was and still is the military and the rapid support forces militia. Yet everyone I spoke to seemed to believe that the men in charge of these institutions were not answerable to the Sudanese people, but rather to external Arab monarchies. Back in April 2019, Sudanese protesters at the sitting told Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to keep their money. A day after Riyadh and Abu Dhabi offered to send Khartoum $3 billion worth of aid. Why? Because it was obvious back then, as it is now, that both countries have a vested interest in Sudan. And those interests have very little to do with democracy. The sitting protesters even chanted, 
We do not want Saudi aid, even if we have to eat beans and falafel. Yet the chairman of the military council, General Abdul Fattah al Buhan, and his number two, General Mohammed Hamdan Dagala, known as Hameti, who ran the much feared rapid support forces, did not feel the same way. This understandably became a key source of friction between the protesters and the military council. <laughs> When the young Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman began the war in Yemen, it became clear from the start that it was a fight he was keen to win without risking Saudi lives and thus would need foot soldiers to confront the Ansarullah Houthi movement on the ground. Sudan led by Omar al-Bashir, who had two outstanding ICC arrest warrants and whose administration was cash-strapped following the succession of South Sudan in 2011, was more than happy to fill that void. In return, the Saudis and Emiratis provided economic support for the struggling dictatorship and crucially would lobby the United States to lift economic sanctions against Sudan and push for political rapprochement between the West and Khartoum. Ironically, while Bashir agreed to the war in order to keep his regime alive, it was actually one of the catalysts for his demise, as it was hugely unpopular amongst the Sudanese population, particularly as the body bags began to add up. What the deposed dictator did not bank on was the men he assigned to lead the Sudanese forces in Yemen would end up replacing him. Buhan led the Sudanese army and Hameti led Sudan's largest militia, the Rapid Support Forces. The war not only brought both generals closer together, but also led them into the arms of the Saudi and Emirati rulers. Withdrawal of Sudanese troops from the controversial war was one of the protest movement's key demands. However, soon after Bashir fell, Hameti was quick to assure the Persian Gulf monarchies that a military council would not bow to popular pressure. <laughs> Saudi Arabia, of course, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE, UAE all them, and Egypt, all they of them, they're trying the to control Sudan. And I think um, this whole Yemen thing is absolutely terrible. KSA is paying the Hamiti so he can send kids that have the, that are in poor situations, that are in terrible situations, give them a lot of money so they can go to Yemen and fight for the Saudis. Because the Saudis, they don't want their people to die. So they're just using teenagers and kids and young boys from Sudan. Sudan. And, teenagers. and they get, okay, they pay their family, but then they go and they die in war. Not everyone felt comfortable showing their face while discussing this controversial topic. All I want is for my people to be safe. I don't want my people to fight a war that's not theirs. No matter what the cost, no matter where you're giving in, the, in return. Some reports allege between 20 to 40% of Sudanese fighters were children. The fighters' families were allegedly paid via the Faisal Islamic Bank, a Saudi-owned bank in Sudan. Because the people who are supporting the inclusion of uh, Sudanese forces in Yemen are very strong and powerful people in the Sudan. The Jinjawit Hameti and the Burhan. And both were working as responsible for the forces in Yemen before the revolution. Sudan plays a pivotal role in the Saudi-led war on Yemen. And there's clearly Saudi and Emirati influence within the military council. How does Sudan chart an independent foreign policy while these regional actors have such vested interest in the Republic of Sudan? That's true. I mean, uh, part of this situation was inherited. For example, the involvement of Sudanese army in Yemen was inherited from the old regime. And we are trying to find a way to finish that. We are concerned with what's happening in Yemen. We are also concerned with what's happening in Saudi Arabia. 
but involving directly in a war is not the, the right thing to do. From what I gathered, Sudan had been propelled into the Saudi-UAE access through the war on Yemen. And this set the stage for Sudan's normalization deal with Israel. But none of this would have been possible without the relationships that had blossomed in the Bashir years between Sudan's military generals and the Persian Gulf monarchies. Bashir was able to stay in power for so long because he made sure the armed forces and the associated militias were looked after, irrespective of how bad the economy was doing. Hameti in particular was one of the key men to prosper during Bashir's final years in power, seizing control of the Jebel Al Mal gold mine in Darfur in 2017 and owning at least three other gold mines in other parts of the country. In fact, that is during Omar al-Bashir's time. The, the army had several factories, uh, trade organizations and things like that. And they controlled the economy of the country. Companies run by the military or by the security forces or the, by, by the police, by the, or the armed groups. So do you think it's likely that they're going to voluntarily give that power to the people? Not give, easy. Not easy. Not easy, but we are fighting to do that. One of the so, things that Hameti committed the armed forces to and Wuhan was to continue the support for the Saudi-led war. In oh Yemen. yes, they are still supporting yeah. that war. Yeah. And now they've recently decided to normalize relations with Israel. Yeah. Is this going to be the pattern going forward? Is the foreign policy going to be dictated by the Bashir's former generals? Of course, we are resisting that. But that is what is going on now. The, this, the pact between Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Egypt. And normalizing relations with Israel. Hameti was able to utilize his vast wealth acquired during the Bashir years to buy the influence and international recognition that has made him the most powerful man in Sudan today. But not without the help of former Israeli Mossad agent Ari Ben Menashe and his company Dickens and Madison. Menashe is currently working as a PR advisor for despots and regime change enthusiasts. He has lobbied on behalf of the Libyan warlord General Khalifa Haftar, Venezuelan opposition figure Henry Falcon, and most recently the military junta in Myanmar. But his most lucrative payday earned him a payment of $6 million from Hermeti in a contractual agreement that promised to get Sudan's military council a meeting with quote the Honorable President Trump as well as meetings with senior personalities in the United States. Signed by Ari Ben Menashe and Lieutenant General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo aka Hermeti. The longer I stayed in the country, the more I realized that the Sudanese people were a long way away from the revolution they hoped to achieve when the protest to remove Omar al-Bashir began. My father protested as a teenager against Aboud's dictatorship, was tortured and detained in his 30s by Nameri's dictatorship, spent his 40s and 50s exiled by Bashir's dictatorship, and spent his 70th and 71st birthday detained again. I asked him if he felt the seemingly endless struggles against Sudan's dictatorships had been worth it, considering how things had played out. I thought things will be better. However, that does not reflect on my life as waste of time. Uh, because the struggle, where is struggling because of its cause, not of its result. However, the result needs more restraining. Two years on, and it's clear things are far from perfect. The Sudanese economy is on its knees, and many have become increasingly frustrated at how things have played out. Yet it's not all doom and gloom. And while there are challenges ahead, they are not insurmountable, and removing Bashir was a step in the right direction. Sudan's been waiting a long time for democracy, and the people know for it to be truly achieved, they will need to ensure that their lives are not governed by unelected men in military uniforms. For the revolutionaries, the fight is far from over, but they cannot rest until decisions related to the Sudanese people are made by elected government officials who are answerable to them and not to foreign powers.
The Republic of Sudan is in a transitional period, with many hoping that the process can lead to a democratically elected government. Yet the question on many people's minds is what role will the Saudis and the Emiratis have on Sudan's foreign policy going forward? Will Sudan continue to support the Saudi-led war on Yemen? Will a future democratic state reverse the normalisation of ties with Israel? These questions remain unanswered as long as the revolution remains unfinished.